When the students of today are the teachers of tomorrow, what will they say about the year 2020? Will this be the year that changed education forever? The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities in education systems everywhere. At the same time, we have all admired the educators, parents, students, and communities that have banded together to meet this challenge. The 12020 Innovation Summit will connect inspiring innovators with educators, researchers, policy leaders, education ministries, students, and parents from around the world. Join us at this free virtual event to share your experiences and learn from like-minded changemakers from over a hundred countries. You will also hear from our global collection of leading innovators in K-12 education who are pioneering solutions that help provide quality education for all, no matter what happens. Register now at www.hundred.org slash summit. Imagination, courage. Uteliaisuus, intuitio, oivaus. La creatività è esprimere se stessi in libertà. Creativiteit is voor mij de belangrijkste streng in het DNA van de mensheid. Sadharan ko asadharan dikha pani ki shamta ko hi rachnatmakta kehte hain. Creativity is about giving yourself time to wonder. Escucha, creación y celebración. A modo tuo. Trathish, jugar, alim. Obunifu ni uhuru akujieleza. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12020 Innovation Summit. My name is Danny Gilliland, Head of Growth here at 100, and I will host our first 100-minute session today where we will focus on creativity and education and learn from some of our innovators. If you're new to 100 or just joining a summit for the first time, let me set the stage a bit. 100 is all about innovation in education and the positive message that change is already happening all around the world. So this event is not about 100, it's about our innovators and educators making change happen in classrooms everywhere. Throughout the next three days, you will hear amazing stories and perspectives on how that change is already happening. We hope you are as inspired as we are to continue the amazing work that you're doing or maybe even start a new innovation of your own. This is our very first annual, uh, sorry, our very first virtual summit, which means it is also our very first summit open to all. We're thrilled to have so many of you from all around the world joining us here today. While nothing can replicate the personal interactions and connections we usually make at our events, we've tried to recreate those opportunities in small workshops and networking sessions. To register and attend, head to the community track on the Attendify application to sign up and meet people face to face. If you aren't on the Attendify app, you can find the link on our website, 100.org slash summit. And now to kick off our main program, I'm honored to announce the results of our spotlight on creativity and education. We've been working closely on this spotlight with the Lego Foundation for the last 12 months since we announced it at the 2019 Innovation Summit. We have been blown away by the quality, quantity, and diversity of the innovations for this spotlight. As a result, with the reviews and help of our global academy all around the world, we ended up selecting over 20 innovations for this spotlight that we will share later today uh, at the end of this session. Head to 100.org slash creativity to view those when they're live. That's enough for me from, for now. Let's hear from Sarah Bushi, Vice President of Programs at the Lego Foundation, where she's gonna share a little bit about her perspective on the spotlight, creativity, and making change happen at a system level.
At the LEGO Foundation, we aim to build a future in which children become creative, engaged, lifelong learners. And to achieve this, we're dedicated to redefining play and reimagining learning to ensure children build the broad set of skills they need to thrive and succeed. One of these key skills is creativity. We know that education systems are interested in creativity, but sometimes they don't really know how to foster creativity. So at the LEGO Foundation, we've worked hard to one, keep creativity high on the political agenda during these really difficult times, and two, to stimulate learning on what really works. We aim to foster discussion by engaging people who exert influence and shape results in the field of education. Our IDEA conference this year focused on creativity. We've produced the Creativity Matter series, a set of LEGO Foundation publications that convene a broad spectrum of viewpoints and opinions. And here today, we are delighted to have this partnership with 100. I am so pleased to have the privilege to open up this exciting 100 Innovation Summit, and the first 100 Summit to open ev to everyone interested in education innovation. As a past participant, I know just how engaging and inspiring this summit can be. And I'm equally delighted that with this summit, we're shining a spotlight on creativity in education. I think we can all agree that these are really challenging times, and it's more critical than ever to understand the existing innovative approaches and creativity and problem solving in our classrooms, whether they be in person, virtual, or maybe even somewhere in between. During last year's summit, the LEGO Foundation and 100 launched a spotlight on creativity, encouraging educators and innovators around the world to share ideas about innovations that cultivate creativity as a skill in schools and classrooms and communities. We believe that there needs to be a greater understanding on how we foster creativity in schools. The aim of our collaboration with 100 is to showcase a carefully curated shortlist of education innovations and creativity. Why? Well, that's easy because people are asking how. If you want to change something, you need to know how to do it. We want to provide concrete examples of leading practice and solutions already affecting children and educators around the world. We share this spotlight on creativity to help shine a light on some of these great examples and to celebrate these great examples. And with that, I am thrilled to launch the report and share the short list of creativity innovators. We have innovations from 14 countries across every continent. A big congratulations to these innovators. They exemplify good practice that fosters creativity and concrete examples from design thinking to creative mindset to teacher training. They highlight a diversity of approaches to promote creativity in education systems. And importantly, the report also distills 10 principles to guide and inspire educators, leaders, and decision makers to formulate strategies that enable innovative approaches for fostering creativity at school level. Given the unprecedented moment that we are in, a supplementary mini report presents case studies of how five of these selected innovators have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and the widespread school closures that have come as a result. This purpose is to illustrate how a variety of innovations have coped with the challenges they face and continue to face and shed, lights, and shed a light on the challenges and learnings since. As a foundation seeking to support and enable partners in creativity and holistic skills, it'd be surprising if some of the organizations on the short list were not partners of the Leo Foundation. Thanks to 100 for an independent process and a robust selection committee, we're excited to see that the creativity innovation movement is much broader than our partner base. And that's why we are also lending not just our resources to this movement, but also our voice to magnify these great examples. What links all of these innovators is what they're driving in schools and communities, change, and injecting the power of creativity into education systems around the world. Creativity is a critical skill and a mindset, one that's personally meaningful and supports a love of learning and that all children can develop and practice through play. We see creativity as an iterative process of connecting and exploring and transforming the world in both new and meaningful ways. We believe that all children can be creative, a potential that can be nurtured over time. 
These are extraordinary times. There is rapid innovation and change. Children will navigate unpredictable challenges and new advances. We know that the acquisition of knowledge alone is no longer sufficient for children to survive and thrive in this new reality, both in work and in life. It's therefore essential that children are supported to develop the kinds of holistic skills that they need. Creativity is one of these core holistic skills for development. It can support individuals to be more engaged in learning, fostering the imagination and curiosity, putting emphasis on increasing confidence and that joy that we all feel around learning, ensuring that individuals can find meaningful connection by learning through the world around them and about the things they care. Creativity can have a positive effect for communities and societies and economies. It fosters greater efforts to find creative solutions to address collective, social, economic, and political issues. For example, we will only ever solve the challenge of climate change if there's more creativity in the world. The role of education in the digital era needs to place more emphasis on developing the kinds of skills that cannot be easily automated. Workers will need to solve problems through unconventional thinking and bring new solutions to market. We know from this year's World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report, the top skills and skill groups that employers see as rising in prominence in the lead up to 2025 include groups such as critical thinking and analysis and problem solving and skills and self-management, such as active learning, resilience, stress tolerance, flexibility. Creativity has been mentioned as one of the top most five most skills in demand. There's no one size that fits all to integrate creative learning approaches in schools. The Creativity Spotlight Report distills 10 important principles and selected innovators that exemplify each principle which we hope will guide and inspire educators and leaders and decision makers to formulate the kinds of strategies that enable an innovative approaches for fostering creativity at a school level. Let me give you some examples. Number two, recognize the importance of intrinsic motivation as being centered around growth mindset, self-efficacy, and a sense of agency. While the inclusion of creativity at a curriculum level shows that a positive shift in mindset at the top level, it does not mean that a lot of concrete changes to include more student voices are integrated into teaching and learning. For example, Design for Change empowers students to be the change agents through local community projects. Principle number seven, thoughtfully bending and eventually dismantling established structural boundaries that enable less scripted teaching and learning in schools. For many educators, students, and institutions, they have been teaching and learning with predefined answers and outcomes. However, fostering creativity is unlikely to thrive if students and teachers are primarily aiming for the achievement of these goals. For example, the Brazilian Creative Learning Network implements a playful, creative, and relevant hands-on educational practice. Take a look at number eight, creative learning environments need to allow for a structured uncertainty, experimentation, risk-taking, and the breaking of conventions safely. I love this one because educators need to practice practical solutions that enable environments to allow students to explore these characteristics. For example, Mitch Resnick offers some guidance here. Activities being implemented in an environment need to allow for what he calls wide walls, where a diversity of approaches and outcomes from students need to be seen from teaching and task design to be considered successful. For example, Scratch. It's both a coding platform and an online community that allows children of all ages to code and share and remix their own stories and games and animations. Learning through play embodies many of these principles. Evidence shows us that play is actually a fundamental way for children's positive development and an essential way to foster creativity and a breadth of skills. Creativity in education and the creative process is infused with the five characteristics of learning through play. Though not all may be present in each instant, it is actively engaging, socially interactive, iterative, meaningful, joyful. In other words, when creators connect, explore, or transform ideas and objects, they do so by actively engaging with those ideas, 
interacting with the social environment, iterating on what they find, providing students with meaningful classroom experiences that enable them to exercise creativity. And finally, creativity can put emphasis on the joy of learning. Creativity is increasingly recognized by policymakers as a critical skill. We've seen from OECD member state demand and engagement with the PISA assessment of creative thinking in 2020, that it will deliver insights to empower and enable education systems in developing creative learners. From our discussions with policymakers from across the globe, we know that there's an increasing appetite to move beyond intention to action, beyond pilots to scaling up, beyond isolated examples to systemic reform. However, they need access to examples, knowledge, and networks to help them make reform a reality. An appetite for reform, it's not enough. Policymakers have told us that they're grappling with how and they want to learn from others. They face a scarcity of role models. Innovations such as these in the report are part of the solution, and innovators have such a strong role in helping systems to adopt and scale these types of approaches. Earlier this year, the LEGO Foundation issued the Creativity Systems Report and shared examples from five pioneering education systems on how they have attempted to make reform happen in their public education systems to enhance learners' creativity skills. Some examples from the report include Scotland, where the Curriculum for Excellence has been implemented since 2010, where creativity was key to develop higher order thinking skills. A review specifically on creativity was also conducted in 2012, which made creative skills, teaching, and learning more explicit. Many more developments to integrate creativity into Scotland schools have been made since. Wales is another example where they're developing a curriculum where creativity plays an integral role. The government has worked closely with the Arts Council of Wales to integrate creativity into the curriculum. In Thailand, a 20-year national reform strategy to be completed in 2037 is currently underway where creativity is seen as a key 21st century skill. We drew, a number, we drew from a number of common lessons across these education systems. This included the need for partnerships across outside government and inside government to strengthen and support reform. Teachers and local leaders played a key role in any type of reform. As I close my talk, I hope that you will be inspired by the spotlight on creativity and the upcoming three-day summit. It is an energizing and exciting event. The COVID-19 pandemic has created the largest disruption of education systems, and there's a danger that education systems will regress. This is the moment. This is the moment where we need champions to stand up for a breadth of skills, including creativity. We ask you to talk to ministries, to work together with other educators, to advocate for children in school systems, to form partnerships with parents, to ensure that a breadth of skills and creativity is prioritized and fostered. We hope that we all can work together to ensure that children around the world can become creative, engaged, lifelong learners. Enjoy the next three days, be inspired, and take action. Play well. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to the LEGO Foundation for sponsoring such an amazing project. It's really been a pleasure to work with you. And also thank you for all the amazing work that the Foundation does to promote play and creativity in students and children around the world. Next, we're going to hear from a few innovators that we selected in the spotlight. While every innovation is unique in its own way, there is one uh, similarity that they all have in common, which is their ability to solve problems. Many of them set out to solve a problem in education or in the world at large. And those problem-solving skills have never been more critical than now and this year with such an incredible change in education and in the world. As I mentioned, part of our theory of change at 100 is to share the positive change that's happening around the world. To that end, we will hear now directly from these innovators on how they're using their own creativity to teach creativity to their students in 2020.
First up, let's welcome Frank from Educate in Africa. Across the world. Just like all of you, uh, our team this year has experienced new and extraordinary challenges. At Educate, we prepare youth in Africa with the skills to succeed in today's economy. And we have therefore uh, created a learning experience with the most essential skills that a young person needs in secondary or post-secondary education in East Africa. For over 10 years, we have operated by partnering with schools in Uganda and directly delivering our skills-based model in over 850 schools in Uganda. But when the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis hit and schools across the region were closed, then all of a sudden, we were effectively out of business. What this meant was that we had to completely pivot the delivery of our model and almost every aspect of our operations. We had to tackle new challenges and charter new territories. When in March, we set out to design, educate first ever distance learning module. Our curriculum design team worked around the clock to transition educate skills-based curriculum to a format that could be delivered remotely through phone and radio. Our goal, of course, was to blend effective distance learning with to, to, to create a holistic and well-rounded learning experience for, for the youth. And this, of course, means we had to be creative and think outside of the box, and most importantly, to work very fast, because from past crises, we know that the longer the youth are out of school, the more unlikely that they are able uh, to return to school. Luckily, creativity is baked into the skill set of a curriculum designer. It is a very critical skill, a very critical competency that allows the designer to think outside of the box and design meaningful learning experiences. It helps the designer to reflect on the challenges that the learners are facing and therefore be able to design with impact in mind. This therefore meant that during COVID-19, our creativity was tested to the core, especially that our designers had to be more creative in thinking about how they understand the challenges that learners are facing, how they should engage learners remotely in learning, and most importantly, to strategize on what technology is the best for engagement and participation. So after five months of continuous, rapid experimentation, experimentation and iteration, we finally launched in August this year, Educate's first ever distance learning module, which we call the Experience Educate on Air. It's a weekly radio talk show that we are broadcasting uh, on national radio. So while the past eight months have been very busy with many late nights and early mornings, what has kept us motivated is seeing the young people that we work with still connected with their education and most importantly, applying the critical skills, the soft skills and the hard skills that is needed for their future. This is what has kept us motivated. Ultimately, we know that it is the young people who are going to tackle the world's toughest challenges and it's our job to support them. 
So lastly, but not least, although moving to distance learning is a new territory for us, we have developed emerging best practices of our own and learned hard lessons. We still have a lot to learn, but we are eager to tackle the challenges inherent in effective distance learning in East Africa. And in doing so, we hope to help push education further into the 21st century and towards a more equitable future. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and such an amazing and inspiring story on how quickly and effectively you pivoted your innovation to serve the students and children in Africa. Amazing work that you do in secondary uh, school training students how to become entrepreneurs themselves. Um, and this, th I also want to mention this story that was also highlighted in our COVID case studies report that our research team put together featuring the creativity innovators, uh, five of the innovators from the spotlight that have had very uh, inspiring and amazing pivots during COVID-19. Um, for anyone out there looking for inspiration, either on your own innovation or understanding how schools and education can pivot and adapt and be creative and how they deliver their work during these unbelievable times, please check out that report, which we will, again, will share at the end of this session. Next, Jigyasa from Slam Out Loud in India. Take it away. All right. Um... I hope you can hear me. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Jigyasa from India, and I'm from an organization called Slam Out Loud. Uh, but before I tell you about what we are doing during COVID and what we do, um, I want to always start with a child's story. So five years ago, I met this girl when I was a teacher in a low-income community in Delhi. And she brought me face to face with questions of power and privilege, especially because for children in her community, you could predict what kind of outcomes the child would have. The story of this girl, however, is not a story of disempowerment. It's a story of hope. Um, while the world is all locked up uh, because of COVID, um, this one is um, not only interning with two organizations, she is taking her online classes, she is teaching her brother at home, building her skill set through course era. Um, and uh, she says one of the ways she's been able to do it is because of the creativity that she's learned. Um, I also want to tell you, she's an amazing spoken word artist who has performed to audiences of running into thousands, has done paid workshops for both other children and adults. And she really, really speaks her truth to power. Um, she uses creative expression not only on stages when she's performing, but to negotiate for change in her life. And I know for sure that she's on a completely different life path. Um, and her practice of this art form has played this huge role in getting her there. Some of you might know this girl as Supriya, um, who was there on the 100th stage last year in Finland and performed her poem and also took a poetry workshop for education leaders, students, teachers from all over the world. This isn't the story, however, of most of the children who grew up in India. Global research shows how art-based education is closely connected to whatever we want education to build, uh, whether it is creativity, social emotional learning, achievement, equitable opportunity. All of this is connected to the arts, yet global deprioritization of the arts shows up um, even in the ratio of art teachers to students in india which is one is to 1400 which means less than 20 hours of art based learning for children who go to public schools and might these might need these skills um, to break that cycle of negative outcomes in their life the most and Slam Out Loud tries to change that. Uh, we're a formation nonprofit that uses art forms like storytelling, theater, spoken word poetry, and visual art to build these 21st century and social emotional learning skills of what we call as creative confidence uh, in disadvantaged children coming from the ages of 10 to 17. Um, how we do this is by running a fellowship program, which places artists into classrooms uh, that children work with for about five years. 
And the second thing that we do is we create products and assets like lesson plans, guidelines, videos um, that are contextualized vernacular for other teachers, communities or students to use. Now, when COVID struck, um, we took some time, essentially about more than two weeks to really, really listen to our children and where they were at. And one of the things that we discovered in the process was that a lot of our children, most of our children were really not missing academics. Um, they were missing social interactions. They were missing meeting their friends. They were missing engagement. What also stood out to us was the great digital divide that existed in our country. Um, a lot of kids, even when they had access to internet, they had access only to low tech pl platforms. And the question that we held at that time was how might we leverage the power of art to build well-being and low-tech platforms to reach out to children that really, really need us. Um, and we started out with a WhatsApp channel to which anybody could subscribe to get an art-based activity sent in their inbox every single day that fostered their well-being because we prioritized well-being as something that we wanted to build in children and children were looking for at this point of time. Within our first week, we got more than 521 other organizations and schools who signed up to receive these activities and spread them to their children which meant that within the first month, without any publicity and only through word of mouth, uh, we were reaching out to about 100,000 children. In the last couple of months, we've experimented with platforms like WhatsApp and also IVRS, where children can call and listen to an art-based activity for well-being, practice it and send their feedback. Um, we're also trying to create material for TV and radio to reach the most vulnerable children. And at about 610 partnerships, across 19 countries and 23 states within India, we are currently reaching out to 4.7 million children through the magic of arts. Um, and that shows to me how access to art and artistic opportunities provided through open platforms can make sure that art-based learning and building creativity can happen for the most vulnerable children and at scale. It was only when I was teaching um, in uh, the government school that I realized that our dreams for children coming from low income communities are restricted either to the security of employment or at best academic su success. But I deeply believe that something as fundamental as finding our voice, being able to express ourselves should not be limited to a privileged class. And I hope for a world where, as Sir Ken Robinson said, creativity is as important as literacy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jigyasa. And really amazing to hear you highlight such critical skills and focuses during this really challenging time. And also that it is available for all. There's so much talk right now about how the pandemic is exacerbating existing inequalities but you really focus on making sure that that's not the case, that children, even in very challenged environments, are, are able to improve their well being and develop the creative confidence you mentioned. I think that's such a great way to put it because while creativity can be this really nice ad, abstract idea to pursue through the arts or through other means, through speech, as you mentioned, it was also such a pleasure to have Supriya here last year uh, giving the workshop and to meet her in person. Uh, but that idea of creative confidence is so important because to be creative, you really need to develop that confidence first. You need to be able to take social and personal risks in public settings, even among friends, to share your ideas, to speak out, to produce art and put it on display. Um, so I've always just admired and loved the work that you do and thank you for continuing to do what you do in spite of such a challenging year. Um, Jigyasa is also featured in our creativity videos, which we will release uh, again at the end of this session, will be available online uh, among many other uh, amazing materials. So next, let's head to Piet in Belgium. What an incredible honor to be here. Uh, thank you to the 100 team and thank you for everybody to tuning in. Um, before talking about something new we have done in the past 12 months, 
let me first briefly introduce you into what we're actually doing. So we are entering the primary classroom with the question, if we could build a dream machine for you, what would that dream machine do? And then we bring in university students and they help out in translating the idea into a concept. And in step number three, we bring in a technical secondary student uh, or vocational students and they help out in building a working prototype. So in one school year, we go from idea to concept to work in prototype and we do this with lots of schools at the same time. For example, to in the end, create dream machines like the chase away the evil ghost from under my bed machine or the shake awake. It's the whole bed that starts shaking instead of just a dreadful noise of the alarm clock in the morning. Or a give me superpowers machine. And when we asked closely, they said, well, it, it's a machine that enables was anybody to become a ballerina. Um, now we are a non-profit uh, organization and we uh, use um, franchi franchising to grow our model to different countries as we speak. But today I want to talk about the red spots on the world map. Uh, this is something new that we've done and we call it uh, My Machine Dream Shop. And what it is, it's a world map which is online you can see it there we can find it and it's an invitation to anybody actually to upload your dream machine idea to the world map whether you're a child or an adult doesn't matter but we also did a, a call to primary school uh, teachers to join with their classroom and you see a video uh, of a school in mexico and uh, children will start uh, making a drawing invent a dream machine and in the end we um picked 15 ideas from schools in Mexico, Ecuador, South Africa, Mozambique and India. And we brought them to this School of Industrial Product Design at West University in Belgium, which is the second video. And these product design and engineering students start conceptualizing those ideas. This, is, this video is from the first day when they used cheap materials to make, uh, to tinker the first solutions that they were thinking of. And of course we used the internet to create feedback loops so that the children in the primary classroom could actually also give feedback to the students on how they were making progress on the on the conceptualizing their ideas. To the right, you see uh, pictures because uh, of, of a diploma because everybody who's uploading a dream machine to the world map actually gets a personalized diploma. Um, uh, and from feedback from the primary school teachers said that they, you know, the children absolutely adored that. Um, Maybe giving you two examples. This is from Gabriel in Mozambique. He wanted something to make him sleep better during the night because he said the, the nights are really warm and dark. He is a bit of, he's a little bit afraid of the dark. So he wanted this device. A he made this beautiful drawing and he wanted this to be a lamp, but also something to cool the air. And at the same time, it had to be able to uh, it had to be able to uh, support his uh, smartphone. And um, there's another example of um, Lamore, who's a child in, in um, who's a child in, in South Africa, and she called her dream machine Ben. And what it is, she wanted it to, uh, she wanted a machine to clean the umbrella of her grandfather, which is a, a fantastic idea, of course. And um, uh, so we're doing my machine because we think that it's important for children in, in primary, secondary and higher education students that they learn that having ideas is important and why and how you can actually bring any idea to life and that you can do it by respecting each other's talent, uh, you know, collaborate, being persistent and resilient. And for some, this is an invitation to tackle something in their personal lives. And for others, this might be an invitation to tackle an issue which is a global issue. But no matter the scope of what you want to tackle, it all starts with the confidence of building the confidence to share your idea and, and to know that you can actually bring any idea to life. So if you are a teacher in primary school, if you are a university professor and you want to join with your students in our next round of My Machine Dreams drop. Um, follow us uh, on our socials and our website because we will go, we were going to launch our second uh, Dreams drop campaign very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Piet. Uh, I'll never forget when I first joined 100, one of the first innovations that I saw was My Machine and have just always been blown away by your approach how you connect the different levels of education, different countries and areas around the world. Um, and I really believe in what you're doing and, and excited to, to see you maintain and, and improve during the pandemic. Up next, we have a panel that I am 
honored to announce uh, we have such an incredible group of folks that we've brought from around different areas of education, uh, experts in their own fields to discuss this critical time in, in education and also in creativity and the awareness and focus on teaching it all around the world. So I will now cut to my tumultuous home country, the United States of America, and Yu Ling, uh, our host for this panel. Five panelists. First, Leo Bird is the Next, Ryan Gon is the Director of Advocacy and Communications at the LEGO Foundation, where they are committed to redefining play and reimagining learning to ensure children develop the skills needed to navigate an uncertain and complex world. Also welcome Gail Gorman, the CEO of Education Scotland, the executive agency of the Scottish government charged with supporting equality and improvement in Scottish education. Also welcome Rob Huben, who is the school manager of Agora, another 12020 innovation, congrats. Agora is a public secondary school in the Netherlands that has no classes, no classrooms, and no fixed curriculum. Instead, each day starts with the student and a simple question of, what do you want to learn today? And finally, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dory Taylor, who is the producer of Remake Learning Days Across America, also a 12020 innovation. This learning festival is an initiative of Remake Learning which is a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning practices in support of young people navigating rapid social and technological changes. So welcome everyone. As we're thinking about change, it's hard not to think about changes that families, youth, educators, and communities have experienced because of COVID-19. This pandemic has caused a disruption to the education systems as we know it. And in many places around the world, parents and caregivers find themselves with a new role as a teacher at home, while in-school and out-of-school educators are finding innovative and new ways to connect with their students and youth and fostering learning and connection through virtual platforms and hybrid education models. So it's with this context in mind that I'd like to start our conversation with this question. Given the pandemic, do you think creativity is losing its priority or is creativity becoming more important than ever in learning? So Leo, let's start with you. What are you seeing across Brazil? Hi, Arlene, uh, thanks for having me here and, and thanks for your question. Um, even though creativity is, is central to our work, we realize that its priority is still very questioned in, in by many places. And uh, however, what we've been noticing with the pandemic is that the, the, the crisis is forcing many school systems to rethink what they focus on giving the very limited access that they have uh, to their students. So what used to be like uh, carrying through four or five hours of face-to-face -face learning is, is now constrained to two or three hours of broadcast, you know? And uh, well, fortunately, after several failed attempts, many school systems are now realizing that it's extremely hard to keep students engaged with traditional, more lecture-centric uh, approaches to, to learning. You know, and that's particularly true for education initiatives that focus on, on young kids. So now uh, with COVID, when these organizations are forced to make a ch uh, choice, many seem to be more, much more interested in trying out activities that are more hands-on, more open-ended and build on students' creativity. And, uh, and, and the, the hope is that by encouraging students to create and express themselves, the idea is that the kids will, will remain more engaged and excited about learning even though the access that they have to teachers and resources is very uh, limited. So um, as we know, education change needs to be very hard and, and very slow, but on the positive side, the, the pandemic is providing us with a great incentive for, for education organizations to, to give creative learning a, a chance. 
So uh, we think it's now up to us to take advantage of this opportunity, you know, and, and make sure that creativity remains more central uh, even after the pandemic is over. That makes a lot of sense. What are the changes that will remain after we go through this pandemic? And Ryan, I want to turn to you. What do you see across the world with your work? Yeah, thanks, Yung Ling. Um, I would say that if anything, we've seen from the pandemic that we're living in a really extraordinary and dynamic time. There's rapid innovation and change. And it's really, really clear that children will and adults will navigate some really unpredictable challenges and new advances. Um, on the importance of creativity, I know we've we've seen some indications. Um, it's still recognized by employers as a really top priority. We, As we heard from my colleague, Sarah, in the keynote, um, only a few weeks ago, the World Economic Forum Future of Jobs report reported employers stating that it would be one of the most in-demand skills in, in 2025. And this isn't surprising. Um, since the survey was, was announced in 2014, creativity has been in the top five. And then I think for education policymakers, we know that that's still on the agenda for many OECD countries, at least. Um, the OECD has moved the, the PISA assessment of creative thinking um, from 2020 to 2022. And this has given education systems a bitter breathing room and will also increase the likelihood that the insights it generates are more useful and reflective of the reality in the classroom. I think this is a really important political signal that OECD member states are really taking this seriously. So generally, I'd say it's become more important, but I know there are some very real threats and opportunities, which I hope we can discuss later. Absolutely. And you're absolutely right in the sense that we have to think about the future for our youth. It can't just be right now. Um, so on that note, I'd actually like to dive deeper into the creativity theme from a school perspective. And I would love to hear a little bit more about how those creativity has been elevated in schools, given the limitations. I mean, we just heard about school is now two or three hours a day that are caused by the pandemic. So Gail, I'd like to start with you. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Scottish schools are actually back full time. So Scottish schools were off um, from March uh, until August, the start of our academic year here. So our kids are back full time with various mitigations, but we put in place uh, a kind of uh, COVID curriculum, which was focusing on health and well-being as its first priority, literacy and numeracy uh, as well. But interestingly, because of the focus of our curriculum for excellence, creativity has always been a central tenant in Scottish education. And so the work um, that we asked schools to do was to care for the children when they came back, to nurture them and to deal with the trauma and, and the, the disruption that they dealt with. Central to that is creativity. And so one of the things that we've certainly been promoting and seen our schools do is open-ended creative tasks. Um, looking at, multi, we call it interdisciplinary learning, but multidisciplinary themes for children to explore their emotions, their experiences, and to deal with some of the trauma many of them have experienced through the loss of a, a family member or, or a change in lifestyle. So Scottish schools are very much uh, looking at innovative projects, building on the digital expertise that, um, you know, lots of schools and teachers took great leaps forward with um, during COVID, but not the passive, you know, sitting or looking at a screen, you know, listening to a, a lecture almost, you know, and taking teaching and learning back to the 18th or 19th century, much more about how they could use um, technologies to create a different pedagogy, to create an excitement and an energy and to use for collaboration and connections between children and their families. So we've seen some quite innovative work um, and actually we're collecting that to be able to share more widely best practice across the system, but creativity to enable the emotions and the trauma and the recovery in terms of health and wellbeing has been quite central to us. I really appreciate your comments on mental health and wellness and as well as creating that environment that allows for kids to reconnect and have that place to find their creativity. That means a lot. Um, and Rob, I wanna to turn to you. I mean, you are at a school. So how is creativity being elevated at Agora? Well, first of all, I, the people who know us know that we, by definition, believe in the fact that students want to learn. 
So uh, what we at the moment see, and we are getting a lot of proof of that. And um, but what I see at other schools is they're getting a lot of proof of that as well. But they get a lot of proof in a, in a, in a different way because at other schools they are getting they are getting forced into be creative because finally we are up to the point that students can turn their preaching teachers off. And uh, when you can turn your preaching teacher off, then you as a teacher have to become creative to be engaging. So uh, I, I think it, these are exciting times which um, get schools into a creative mode instead of in that old preaching mode that, that for instance, Gail was talking about uh, just before. So what we see at Agra is that we can't turn off this creativity with children. Uh, we had to close our school in, in uh, uh, last, uh, last spring. And uh, so we send it out an email to all uh, kids and uh, to all the parents that, well, we have to close after the weekend. So on next Monday, we will take a day for the team to, um, to look, uh, look and prepare for how to approach education starting next Tuesday. Please give us one day. And uh, the cool thing during that day was that all of my uh, coworkers uh, started to getting emails to get uh, Google Hangout inv in invitations by the students. So these kids, we couldn't turn them off. They were just proceeding with what they were doing normally in our school. And what they were doing that day was learning us how to connect with them when they were at home. So we thought that we were in a meeting to investigate how to connect with students and, and get them into learning when they are at home. But meanwhile, they were telling us the same thing. So we have to listen to these kids. They are the solution. They have the solution. And as long as we don't start preaching, but ask them what they need what, and what their needs are, then we all are in this creative move. And then we can solve any problem. And uh, I, I think we are doing that. And uh, for us, the most difficult time was when the school went, uh, went back to uh, being open again. That, that was more difficult than getting closed because being open, there were people who are having doubts. Uh, should I go to school? Is it dangerous to get in the train uh, and stuff like that? That was far more difficult for us than, than close. It is a difficult time right now, right? Yeah. Um, but I love what you said, and I saw a lot of heads nodding on this panel about kids are created by nature. They, you cannot turn it off and really put them in the place of being the teacher. That's a great... Yeah. And, and, and they can. And the great thing now is that they can turn this, these preaching teachers off. That's the great thing. That means that these preaching teachers have to change. That's the benefit of COVID. Well, so actually, I'd like to just turn the conversation a little bit to the parents and caregivers. We've spoke about the youth and the teachers. Um, you know, this pandemic has given parents and care caregivers an up close view of how their children are learning. And oftentimes parents and caregivers are worried that they're either not doing enough or that their kids will fall behind. So I'd like to turn to my colleague, Dory. And what have you learned through Remake Learning Days and what would your advice be to parents and caregivers? Thank you, Yuling. First of all, parents, caregivers, take a deep breath, breathe, Inhale, exhale, and know you're doing okay. <laughs> and okay is good enough in this moment. Listen, with Remake Learning Days and Remake Learning Days across America, we have had the good fortune to work with the Global Family Research Project and survey caregivers, youth attendees, so pre-K through 12th graders, and event hosts and we found out through the hands-on learning events that we produce, um, it's important for youth to learn with an adult next to them. Uh, the adults don't have to know everything and the adults don't have to lead the effort, but when pre-K through 12th graders um, are at a Remake Learning Days event with a caregiver, with a grandparent or an uncle or a parent. They enjoy the experience more. They are more engaged in the learning, whatever that might be, and they tend to succeed and grow more. Um, so when schools or libraries 
or museums reach out and engage with the whole family, then that's very impactful to the learner. Um, so that's just something to know and, and to hold on to and hear that, oh, the youth, the young people appreciate the adults in their lives and the caregivers or the, the parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles being beside them. And in these COVID times, we may not be going to the library or to the museum or uh, to a learning center with our kids, but we're learning together at home. Uh, so perhaps your child is baking with their grandparent. Um, they're learning math through measuring. I mean, my children love baking cookies with their grandmother because they enjoy the cookies and they enjoy making pies because they enjoy the end result, <laughs> but they're learning the measurements. Um, my kids have enjoyed making a garden bed in the yard with my husband and we have been growing our own vegetables in these times, but they built the, um, the garden box with wood and nails, the whole thing. Uh, so again, measuring math, science, growing our own vegetables. Um, so parents and caregivers know that uh, just being around your young people, they are learning from you, you are learning from them, and they are appreciative of you. Yes, and I think you know, one of the things that I'm hearing from you is parents and caregivers need to have that same confidence to jump a little bit into the unknown and get creative and be right aside. It's okay if you don't know the answers, right? It matters that you're engaged. Um, so, so I'd like to turn to Rob a little bit on this question, but from a different angle, what would you say to parents who say, my child is falling behind? Yeah, well, I think children can't fall behind per definition. Uh, a child can only be behind if you compare it with a group or with other individuals. But what we need to realize is that people in a group have different ages, different backgrounds. Their life is, they live in different circumstances and they also have different needs. So because of that, their personal growth is non-comparable by default. And, and we see that even with twins developing themselves in other ways, which you can't compare. And uh, um, so for parents who think that their kid is a student is behind, I can only agree with that if we are talking about teaching to the test. You can be behind on teaching to the test. And you can also be behind on forgetting the information from the test the day after the test. Um, but what we need to keep in mind is that learning isn't about learning to the test. It's about personal growth. It's about remembering stuff. It's about remembering lifelong lessons. So only those things really, really matter, not the teaching to the test. Most of that you forget the day after. So I think even a student can never be behind in personal growth or, or in learning lifelong lessons. And what we need is teachers to learn to challenge that, that, that every individual student, we should challenge uh, every teacher to, to uh, challenge that individual student to grow a little bit every day. And that's far more essential than comparing children with each other. Right? And, and that's how creativity grows as well. If, if we know that every child is creative, then we just help, need to help them create more and they will grow and they will never fall behind on their own growth. You know, it's so much about that journey, isn't it? And about that individualized learner profile. It makes a lot of yeah. sense. You know, I want to turn to Ryan and Gail and ask a question. You know, on that note, also what we heard from our keynote speaker, Sarah Pucci, about the critical role that creativity plays in solving problems, increasing confidence, making meaningful connections. You know, as you look ahead, what gives you hope or worry about the centrality or the central role of creativity and education. Wow, um, that's a that's a big one, I'd say. Um, I'll start with worry and then move to hope. Um, I think, well, firstly, the pandemic has really created, obviously, the largest disruption in of education systems in history. So there's a, I think, there's a real danger that education systems will regress. Um, there's obviously a 
we're in a time of increased need. There's huge learning loss. There are now access challenges to education, quality challenges. But I think there are two very real threats which are ultimately related to, to political will within education systems. Is education itself going to be prioritized? And within that, will skills such as creativity be prioritized? I think on on the first, governments at all levels, national, provincial, municipal, they're going to be facing resource constraints and any new normal is going to prioritize public health, economic revitalization, social protection, which are all undoubtedly really critical. But to best enable today's and tomorrow's learners, it's really important that policymakers avoid making decisions today, which will create future problems. So. I think there's a big risk in a time of competing political priorities and attention that investment in education will will decline. We know that some countries have already proposed cuts, including some as high as 45 percent um, to education budgets, which is which is huge. Um, so at this really strange time when education systems actually need more resourcing, um, there's going to potentially be less political bandwidth and attention and resources. And then secondly, on threats, I'd say it relates to how much skills such as as creativity will be prioritized. We have seen a bit of um, of regression in this space. Um, There's been, you know, a cut to curriculums to focus on core subjects such as literacy and numeracy. And in some some cases, we know we've seen those cuts affect creative subjects such as art, music, design and drama. However, I'm optimistic um for for two main reasons um one there are signs that countries are kind of waking up to these threats um we saw last month that the um there was a global education meeting um and that had some really positive commitments um to increase and maintain spending um skills development particularly on SEL as well but the big question is whether or not these commitments will be honored we at the Lego Foundation are really proud to be a, a, an active member of the, the Save Our Future campaign, which is calling for budgets to be protected and increased um, alongside demanding that young people are equipped with 21st century skills. So that's been a really, really nice coalition. So we've seen this mobilization coming together. And then strange, we now know that radical change in education is possible. We've seen systems, teachers and parents kind of step up and embrace new environments and tools. And we've also seen the power of playful and engaging approaches in stimulating learning and skills development. Um, as we saw in our report we published earlier this year, creating systems, there, there already are already many pioneering countries such as Scotland, which have been really driving a creativity agenda across their education systems. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that these systems, such as Scotland, which we heard about earlier, have also been doing some really interesting work in response to to COVID. Um, And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that. So I think now countries recognise that there is also an opportunity to reform, that now is the chance to reimagine learning and modernise education systems. So in summary, I guess, in both tackling the threats and the opportunities, what's really needed is champions to stand up for skills such as creativity. We at the LEGO Foundation are only one voice in this space, and we really are keen to work together as educators, parents, businesses, civil society, to really engage civil um, decision makers at all levels of the school system to ensure that right now creativity is both prioritized and fostered. This is a really critical moment um, to reform our education systems and reimagine learning. We should not squander this. A good reminder, this is this can be looked at as a unique opportunity to make the changes that we've been talking about. And Gail, I saw you nodding your head and I want to hear more about how creativity is happening and will remain in Scotland. Yeah, just just kind of echoing uh, the the wise words there of Ryan, who uh, you know, like a uh, foundation we work with in Scotland, uh, and it's a great partnership. For me, if I start again, you know, teacher like I'll start with a worry. My worry, you know, resonates very much with what Ryan was saying, but also uh, one of the things we've seen our schools have been back now about ten weeks, is I'm really worried about the capacity of our school leaders. 
our school leaders, our educators, our innovators are having to deal with things none of us could have imagined and particularly around health and safety and guidance and risk assessments and all those things are, you know, that are absolutely essential but are wearing down the innovation and creativity and the space for school leaders and, and the school teams to focus on creativity, to focus on innovation and pedagogies. And, you know, for all, we're, we're really lucky with the workforce we have and the focus we have in our curriculum here. I'm really worried that some of the, the most innovative and creative thinkers in the field, are they still going to be on their feet at Christmas? This is, you know, something we've been really worried about. They made it to, we have a holiday here in October, they made it to the October half term, but by their fingernails. And actually to stimulate uh, creativity in a school through your staff, with your children and young people and your students, you actually need to be in that creative mindset yourself. Um, so I'm just worried about the long-term tail of COVID and the pressure, the huge pressure. I was up this morning being on a call with a group of Scottish head teachers this morning who are all absolutely wonderful and creative leaders and they are exhausted and they're saying their teams are exhausted. So I think there's a there's something about, you know, the kind of adrenaline rush when schools returned and about, you know, making sure we nurtured and looked after our young people and were creative and innovative. But actually, will that momentum and that uh, crisis recovery mode actually be something that leads to a tale of a very much poorer educational experience for, for our young people? So I'm concerned about that and the loss of some of those leaders to the system. Because some of them are saying, I was going to retire in five years, actually. I'm going at Christmas. So so we've got a, a cliff edge there. We need to think about support for our leaders who are dealing with it, not from their living rooms like us, not from their office, but actually out there uh, facing it. But on, on a positive note, um, I, you know, my hope is actually having seen that real change in, in teacher agency. In Scotland, we have a policy where we've talked about empowerment and getting schools to be innovative and, and design and make curriculum decisions at the point closest to the learner, very similar to Rob's work and, and some of the, and the innovations there about the children and young people leading the learner. And actually overnight with schools closing on 48 hours notice, our educators had to do that, you know, because they didn't have a captive audience in the school. They weren't able to do the preacher teaching as, as we were talked about earlier. They actually had to think creatively about how do you engage kids who've got all these other stimulation at home? How do we do things a bit differently? And to see some of the learning and innovation that's come from that. And we've got a, a line we use here a lot about building back be better. We want to build back better um, because actually we've seen digital innovation just completely flip on its head. We've seen flipped classrooms and we've seen the voice of the learner actually come to the forefront and that can only be a positive from what we've all um, been, been talking about today. So for me seeing teacher agency actually take place and you know that led to then our society, parents valuing teachers in a way that perhaps in the UK had been diminishing for some time and suddenly you know through the, the parents getting a bit stressed and a bit anxious about you know, were they doing the right thing and of course they were actually people saying, gosh, how do teachers do this? How do teachers stimulate and energise and innovate every day and get children to have an irresistible curriculum that they engage with? And so for us, there's also, for me, the hope is that actually we've got a very different dialogue now in Scotland with our parents who understand our curriculum a bit more and our focus and why creativity is important and actually are now active partners in that. So I think, you know, those, you know, having parental engagement, we all know makes a huge difference to, to outcomes for an, an inequity in particular, but also seeing that innovation and teacher agency taking control of the learning and shaping it for the learners that they know best has been fantastic. It truly is a partnership amongst all partners. It really is. I'm going to turn to our last question, which I'm going to combine a little bit with an audience question. This will be for Leo and Dory in the last minute that we have. Um, it's been really fun. So, you know, this pandemic has reminded the world that education is everyone's business. We just spoke about that. Parents, teachers, the community. And when we think about learning, it really can happen anywhere. Schools, libraries, museums, parks and beyond. 
I'd love to hear an example of how you've seen an out-of-school organization elevate creativity in the community. So Leo, we'll start with you and then turn to Dory and then we'll send it back to, the, to Danny in the studio. Uh, depends on face-to-face -face learning. So with the pandemic, they really had to rethink their practices and do their best working at a distance. And that's quite challenging in Brazil, especially because many people do not have uh, good access to the internet or computers. So the connectivity issue is it's, it's a big one for us. And uh, so in order to cope with this challenge, so, uh, different organizations are trying different things. Some of them started creating uh, little kits and, and sending them home so that kids could build on their own and then try to run activities via WhatsApp not to bring everybody together. Um, some museums like the, the Oscar Niemeyer Museum, which is one of our largest, start providing online activities and, and workshops inspired by their artists in their collection. And, uh, and our organization, the, the Brazilian Creative Learning Network, we end up creating a portal called uh, Creative Learning at Home. It can be accessed via going to creativelearningathome.org. And there you can find lots of activities you know, that can be implemented using craft materials, recyclables, and old toys, and whatever things you might have available at home. You know? So uh, people are trying different things, and uh, there's no one solution fits all. And we love to learn from what the others are doing you know, in this panel and from and the audience too. Yeah, and Dory, in the last 10 seconds, what do you have to add? Yeah, we also have creative learning at home here in Pittsburgh and across the United States. So very similar, everything mm -hmm. Leah is saying, I plus one or I echo. Um, practically, we have some organizations like libraries and maker spaces who have erected hotspots. Uh, so they're encouraging families to come and park in their parking lots to utilize internet and Wi-Fi for their children and for themselves. So that's a practical level and it creates, creatively, we have organizations sending um, kits, science kits, to families and youth, uh, maker kits, art kits, as Leo was saying, and either families can pick them up at the organization or the organization is delivering those kits to families. And they don't necessarily have to have connectivity and be connected and, and watch or do uh, on Zoom or Google Meets, but they can just open the box or the kit, read the instructions and create for a whole week with everything they've been given. So thanks to out of school time organizations for also jumping in to this. Absolutely. And you know, this thank you to all our panelists today and our speakers and all the examples you've elevated in the community and across the world. This gives me a lot of hope for the future. Sending it back to Danny in the studio. Thank you, Yu Ling, and thank you for all of our panelists. We know that was a packed panel with some amazing experts, so we really appreciate uh, you all keeping it quick, but also sharing such amazing stories about how you're able to keep creativity going during these challenging times and with so many different stakeholders and so many parts of the education experience for students. Um, you mentioned a few things that I think are really critical in developing creativity, one being that it is a long-term process. Um, and, and that also means that you know, not only can we not give up right now, but we also uh, can be patient. And then we know that as teachers need to learn creativity and how to teach it for students to be able to pick it up, so do parents. And so those materials that you've all created in these at-home kits are so critical right now uh, for parents at home and for students that are either dealing with remote learning or learning on their own time. Uh, but such an amazing uh, and inspiring a group of people. Uh, also, Rob, always great to hear about your approach that, uh, or your belief that you can't really fall behind if there's nothing to measure to, and, and the individualized approach to both uh, education and creativity. Also, thank you, Gail, for joining and sharing how you've, uh, how you've implemented this across an entire system. Um, such a rare and impressive feat. Um, and we all know that I'm sure the students of Scotland uh, are all better for it and also the future of the country. So thank you all very much. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our final speaker and keynote for today, Mitch Resnick, uh, Master of Creativity out of MIT Media Lab, has created several 
uh, or helped with several innovations, and we're really excited to have you. Thank you, Mitch. Okay, well, it's really wonderful to be joining you. Uh, real thanks to you and the rest of the 100 team and to the LEGO Foundation for putting this together. It was great to read through the Creativity Spotlight Report, which I think resonates with a lot of the ideas uh, that, that we focus on in our group. And it was great to hear the, the other speakers on the panel and before them, who we all also, I think, share in some of those common themes. I think as we go about our work in our group at the MIT Media Lab, we're often focused on the, the importance of helping young people today develop three important qualities. We want to help them learn to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. And I think those skills are important for everybody uh, growing up in today's society, everywhere in the world. And I think they would have been important in all eras. If I were around 100 years ago, I hope I would have been arguing for those same qualities but I think they're especially important today as we're living in a world that today's children are growing up in a world where, where they will face a never ending stream of unknown and uncertain and, and unpredictable situations. So that ability to think and act creatively is more important than ever. And I think it's really been driven home in the past year, as we've heard from many of the previous speakers, that during the pandemic, it's really highlighted the importance of creative thinking to deal with the uncertainties and the unknowns in today's situation. Whether you're a medical professional trying to deal with some of that public health challenges, or just an individual trying to make sense of how to organize your family on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think this importance of thinking creatively and reasoning systematically and working collaboratively has also been driven home. I've been thinking about a lot in the past day as we come to the final stages of the US election, because in the recent months, we've seen this constant assault on truth and reason, uh, and even just the whole uh, of approach of democracy. So I think it's more important than ever to help the next generation grow up who will be able to you know, deal with these you know, issues through being able to think creatively, reason systematically, work collaboratively to help support a world in which everybody is given those opportunities to create, design, explore, experiment, and reach their full potential. So what does it mean uh, for people to develop these types of creative mindsets and creative capacities? Let me start by giving an example uh, that I saw recently from, it was an example from our Scratch online community. As many of you know, Scratch is a programming language and online community that we developed in our group at the MIT Media Lab, and it allows young people uh, to create their own stories and games and animations and share their creations with others around the world. And millions and millions of kids around the world are now creating and sharing with Scratch. Every day, there are tens of thousands of projects shared in the online community. The last March, one project that went on the online community caught my attention. As you can see here, was posted on March 18th, right as the pandemic was starting to lead to lockdowns around the world. And it was a project that was focusing on random acts of COVID kindness, made by a member of the Scratch community with the username, hello, yo, what's up? And as I looked at this project, it really caught my attention. And if you look at some of the notes that hello, yo, what's up wrote with this project, it was about, you know, and trying to encourage others to be able to uh, use Scratch to bring a little happiness and kindness into other people's lives. And she mentioned it had been three years since she last shared a project and seven years since she joined the site. But she came back during COVID because she said social isolation due the, to the pandemic has given me the combination of free time, a desire to create something, and the need to spread kindness that brought me back here. And for me, that represented some of the qualities that we're looking for. And I was proud to see that a member of the community was rising to this, using the community to express themselves creatively, but to connect with others, to spread kindness, to be part of a caring community. Because we see those qualities are so important to in, in the uncertain times we live in, the qualities of creativity and collaboration 
and caring and kindness. And we saw this coming to light in a project like this, where Hello, Yo, Yo, What's Up was offering to make projects to bring happiness into other people's lives and to match people together so they could support one another. So I look back to see, well, Hello, Yo, What's Up, what was the story through her journey on the Scratch community? She joined in 2013. And in fact, since then, she created number six, more than 600 projects. And you can see on her profile page, this repository of hundreds of projects that she created. Before the act of COVID kindness, she last made one in 2017. So she made these 600 projects between 2013 and 2017. And here was actually the very first project that she put up in April, 2013. And it was a simple little story game that was based on a book that she had read. She explained that she'd first learned about Scratch in her fourth grade classroom. So she learned about in class, then started using it outside of school with friends. And she started making projects based on things that she'd read. This was based on Betsy Tacey historical fiction. And she created different characters and brought them together and shared stories. But as I look back, even in that first project, you get a hint of what was special about some of the ways she was engaging. In addition to creating projects, you see in her notes, she said, please post suggestions. I love them and very well may use them. So she already was not just creating, but connecting with other people, listening for others, you know, listening to others, incorporating their ideas into what she was creating. And that's such an important part of the creative mindset to engage with others, to listen to what they say, take suggestions and continually iterate is such an important part of the creative process. You can see that she was bringing to bear as she was working in the Scratch community. As I looked through her projects, we could see Hello, Yo, What's Up came with all sorts of different ways of engaging with the community. So here's a project that she put up just a few months later in July, 2013. It's called Blob CC, CC in Scratch, often refers to coloring contest. So here, what Hello, Yo, What's Up did, she just put a simple circle there and then put up a challenge. She said, please use this circle in your own project and color it in and make a different project based on this circle. And you can then see how other people remixed her project and led to all different types of creative projects. There were certain games. Someone took the circle, made a basketball to turn into a basketball game. Here's another type of game where they took the circle and made a character that had a crown, a crown, but also gave the user options. At the top of the screen there, you can see you could put a crown on or put a bow tie or a beard. To the other part of the screen, for those who haven't seen Scratch, you can see those blocks are ways of describing the behaviors of the characters. So the other people were using Hello, Yo, What's Up Circle, elaborating the design, but also making it come to life through programming. And they put the blocks together, somewhat like building Lego bricks into a structure. In Scratch, you put the programming blocks to create behaviors. Other people made characters and turned them to narratives and stories. So we can see all the different ways that people built on Hello, Yo, What's Up work. Actually, my colleague, Natalie Rusk, interviewed Hello, Yo, What's Up to find out more about her experiences. And in talking about this project, Hello, Yo, What's Up said, it's kind of crazy to see all of that creativity from just a circle. But I think there's something we often see with creativity. You can start with a simple thing that maybe someone else suggests to you and you build upon it. You remix it. You take ideas from others, you add your own, and then all sorts of different creativity comes from it, going in all sorts of different directions. And I think we see that with Hello, Yo, What's Up was both triggering creativity in others, but also in her own projects. If you look through the 600 projects, you see this enormous variety of what Hello, Yo, What's Up has created. There was musical projects and tutorials uh, and projects wishing others happy birthday. So all different types of cards and animations and games and tutorials. And that's something that we look for when we're trying to get a sense of the creativity, whether it's of an individual or of a workshop or a class, we look for variety and diversity because if somebody made 600 projects, but they're all similar to one another, the quantity would not impress us. 
is the diversity and range of things that they're creating that shows the creativity that she developed as she was on the site. So I think you can see as Hello Yo What's Up was working on these projects, she was learning to think creatively, coming up with this wide range of different projects, sparking other people to be creative, building on what others were doing. She was learning to reason systematically, putting together those graphical programming blocks to start with simple building blocks, but to make complex behaviors from them. Uh, having a logical, reasonable, systematic way of reasoning through problems and design. And she was also learned to work collaboratively, coming up with all different ways of collaborating, whether to encourage others to create or building on work that others did or making greeting cards for others in collaboration with them. So we see that through these types of environments, we can help support young people developing those skills that are so important uh, in their lives today. These skills will be important in their future work lives, but it's not just about their work lives. Certainly many, many new jobs today will require these types of creative thinking skills, but it's also important in their civic lives to be a member of a, of a society that's going through such civic challenges and, and also to go through, to, to apply them to their personal lives and to deal with the challenges of pandemic and other changes in our lives. So, we hope that through these types of settings, young people can develop these capacities that will be so important to thrive and be active contributors in today's world. So how is it that we can support the development of these types of you know, capabilities? And in our group, we've often focused on four guiding principles for fostering creativity. And we call them the four P's of creative learning, projects, passion, peers, and play. We always want to provide young people with opportunities to engage actively in projects that are based on their passions in collaboration with peers in a playful spirit. And I think you can see this in the Scratch community. As we developed Scratch, we were always thinking of these four Ps. Scratch is not based on you know, giving a series of problems to kids to solve and move on to the next problem. That's how many young people are introduced to coding these days. We took a different approach. We want kids to start with their own ideas, you know, create a project based on those ideas, because we knew that's the best way for them to develop their creative capacities. But we know it's important for young people to work on things that are based on their own interests and their passions. They're gonna be willing to work longer and harder and persist in the face of challenges if they're following their interests and passions. And we see the most creative work comes not when you're working by yourself, but you're working with and learning with peers and learning from peers. And we see that happening through the Scratch online community and all the examples of how you saw Hello Yo What's Up interacting. And we wanna do it in a playful spirit. And when I say play, sometimes this is misinterpreted. Sometimes people think of play and they just think of laughing and having fun. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. When we think of play, we think of it more as an attitude, not as an activity. We have a playful attitude. It means you're willing to take risks and try new things. And creativity always comes from people who are willing to try new things and test the boundaries. So we wanna create an environment that's comfortable where people feel at home and comfortable in trying new things. So it's wonderful that someone like Hello Yo What's Up felt comfortable enough to come back to the Scratch community, saw it as a comfortable place to try new things, to experiment with things like random acts of COVID kindness. So it was a playful way to work on projects based on passions and collaboration with peers and continue to develop her own creative capacities and support others in developing their creative capacities. And of course, an online world like Scratch is only one of many, many ways for young people to be developing those creative capacities. Actually, let me show you a video of one of the workshops that we ran that gives you a sense of how we, how we run workshops. As we work on workshops, we're also guided by these four Ps of projects, passion, peers, and play. So this is like a minute long video of a workshop we ran in our lab space at the Media Lab a couple of years ago. Uh, that young people ages like nine to 12 came in uh, with the challenge of 
you know, creating a park. Was, the theme was a day at the park. We'll often set a theme, but then give a wide range of different materials and possibilities for how they can explore the theme. So let's take a look and think of those four Ps as you watch the video. The goal of these creative workshops is really to give children an opportunity to come up with their own ideas, imagine something, and then figure out how to design it. We should still keep this place, but take this. They need to be constantly exploring, experimenting. It works. Whoa. Oh my God. Yeah. Metro discovery by testing things, by tinkering, by experimenting, by creating. They're using Lego motors and sensors. And then if it doesn't work the way they want, they start revising it. So you have to kind of adjust the motor power so they, it actually has enough power to knock the dice off. So they're really learning through having a goal, having imagining something, and then bringing it to life. So rather than just thinking of the computer of something that I think, what am I supposed to do? They start thinking, what do I want to do with it? They start getting new ideas. I think even just from that minute long video, you could get a sense of that playful spirit where kids are trying new things, experimenting. It's okay if it goes wrong. You see many things do go wrong, but in a creative process, things are gonna go wrong, but you learn from mistakes. You don't see it as a problem, but it's something that you can then learn from and try something new. And you see the young people here adjusting and trying new things. Another thing that I really like about this video, it shows the use of all different types of materials and different kids will use different materials. You see everything from very traditional materials that kids might have used hundreds of years ago, a ball of cotton, a stick, uh, some more modern materials like Lego bricks that let you build sturdier structures, and then even more modern materials like scratch, which is then controlling the Lego materials. So kids are building on the screen to control things in the world. So you want to create opportunities for kids to do all types of creating, whether it's on the screen or off the screen or in combination, and provide a wide range of materials. Actually, as Sarah said in the opening comments, we believe firmly in this idea of wide walls. We want to let children, we want to create environments that have a low floor where it's easy to get started and a high ceiling. You can do more and more complex things, but maybe most important, wide walls, meaning that different kids can have their own pathways into the activity because different kids have different interests. So we need to support many different pathways. So having lots of different materials and lots of different possibilities for how they can work on their projects and ways of working together is such an important part for everyone to reach their full creative potential. Let me give one final example of another project we worked on that was creating spaces for learning, also based on those four Ps. And it, over, it actually interlocks with our work on Scratch. And that's the, our work on the Computer Clubhouse Network. Actually, this will be featured in one of the breakout sessions tomorrow that's led by Gail Breslow, who's now the executive director of the Clubhouse Network. And we started the clubhouses in our group at MIT in collaboration with the local museum like 30 years ago. It's now an independent nonprofit network. Um, and actually these images are from the early 2000s. This is from 2004, because the clubhouses were intended as places for young people to come and use technology in creative ways to learn to express themselves creatively and to try new things. And they were designed especially to reach young people who hadn't had many of these opportunities before. So there's now a network of 100 of these clubhouses around the world. Uh, and they're all intended in order to reach young people who often haven't had the opportunities, often in communities that have faced systemic inequities and injustices. And I think just the, actually this, these photos are from the very first Scratch workshop we did. Our idea for Scratch grew out of our work at the clubhouse. We saw that young people at the clubhouse wanted to design their own stories and games and animations, but there weren't the right tools. And I do think there's a key aspect of scaling any innovation, making sure that it's being designed, that you have a deep understanding of what young people are looking for. We designed Scratch because we saw what young people at the clubhouse really wanted, and we designed it for them. And then when you connect with the interests and the, of people, that's what's at the foundation for helping things scale. And then making it part of a community. Scratch, I think, has scaled so successfully because it's part of a community. Hello, yo, what's up? Didn't come just to create projects, to be part of a community. 
And we find that many people in the Scratch community say the same things. They keep coming back, not just for creative expression, but because they can do it with others. And that supports the scaling. The same thing with the Clubhouse Network, which are physical spaces, and there are a hundred of them, but young people come to connect with the community at their own clubhouse and then across different clubhouses around the world. I'll finish with one final story from the clubhouse. This is an image of a clubhouse I was visiting. This is one in Amman, Jordan. And I think you can even see just from the layout of the clubhouse, how it aligns with those four Ps. Projects are on the walls. You can see what people have created in the past. They're highlighted. There are lots of spaces for collaborating. The chairs even have wheels so you can easily reconfigure them to form groups to work together. Uh, you can see there's a wide range of different things, different types of examples of what kids have done. I was really remember, I have these strong memories of the visit to the clubhouse in Amman, Jordan, because I was visited, I was invited to Amman by the government of Jordan, who was impressed with the success of the clubhouse there. They were concerned because they had many other community technology centers they were not succeeding. They wanted me to come and help them understand why weren't their centers succeeding the way the clubhouses were. So I went and visited, and here's an image of one of their, they were called knowledge stations. And for me, I think you can quickly see the real difference just looking at the space, how it's different from a clubhouse. It's pointing forward, designed for a teacher to be instructing. There's no space for people to collaborate. There are no examples for inspiration on the walls. For me, this image is a type of metaphor for the challenges that we face of still too many places holding on to outdated approaches to education. They're based on the delivery metaphor, uh, that, that education being thought of as a way of delivering information or delivering instruction. So we need to shift the way people are thinking about education and learning and change the way they put it into practice. Now that's not easy, but I think that's the big challenge ahead of us. We have to shift people's mindsets and structures of education in order to open up the possibilities for creative learning for all kids everywhere. And this is challenging. There are a lot of entrenched structures, you know, that there are barriers between different subjects in schools, there are barriers between times of the day. There are barriers between in school and outside of school. We need to break down those barriers to change the structures of schools and to change people's mindsets so they no longer see education as a mean, as just a matter of delivering instruction or delivering information, but a way of cultivating creativity to allow everybody to express themselves creatively, to think creatively, uh, but to shift those mindsets and to shift those structures is, is hard work. Uh, it's gonna take all of us working together. So I wanna end by reaching out to all of you to make these changes. It's so important to provide these opportunities for all young people around the world. It's gonna take all of us working together to make it happen. It will really require a movement that brings together educators and designers and policymakers and curriculum developers and administrators First, to make sure that they all embrace a new vision of what education and learning can be and should be in an age where creative thinking is more important than ever before. And then once they embrace that vision, to work together on how to put it into practice through projects, passion, peers, and play. I see this as the most important thing any of us can be working on. I'm dedicated to focusing on this. I hope the rest of you well as well, and I look forward to working with you to share these ideas, to make sure that we can provide all young people from all backgrounds with opportunities to be full and active contributors to tomorrow's society. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mitch, for sharing all the amazing work that you do. We certainly agree on creating a movement uh, that's what we do here at 100, head to 100.org to join the movement today if you're not a part already. So just want to wrap up our creativity session here. Thank you uh, for joining. Congratulations to all of our creativity innovators selected in the spotlight. You can go to 100.org slash creativity to view the report, the selected innovators, and more. We have the global collection coming up now in about 25 minutes. In the meantime, read the report, watch the 100 showcase on Attendify, and we'll see you soon.
Joy, imagination, courage. Uteliaisuus, intuitio, oivaus. La creatività è esprimere se stessi in libertà. Creatività è per me la belangrijkste streng in het DNA van de mensen. Sadharan ko asadharan dikha pane ki shamta ko hi rachnatmakta kehte hain. Creativity is about giving yourself time to wonder. Escucha, creación y celebración. A modo tuo. Tratish, jugar, alim. Obunifu ni uhuru akujieleza.